Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivers. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. And today we're going to talk about a really cool uh, topic. And I know you've, you've seen my jaundice skepticism about so many different things. But today I'm actually going to speak very positively about something that has occurred slowly over time where our understanding has evolved. We're going to talk about FODMAPs. F-O-D-M-A-P. And that's an acronym. Uh, but it's also, this covers diseases like irritable bowel syndrome, which so many people are plagued with. What does FODMAP stand for? FODMAPs is fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. What the hell does that mean? Basically, it comes down to the diseases that sugar, starch, and fiber, and the vegetarian biome cause to us. And this is very, very worth looking at, purely from a biologic perspective. Uh, folks, if you, if you like the content of this uh, topic, hit the subscribe button and possibly even hit the little bell signal on, this, on your YouTube channel to remind you when new, when new um, uh, videos drop. They drop every Tuesday and, and Thursday, typically. And feel free to leave a comment. But leave a comment based on the content, not based on your knee-jerk critical uh, effects. Whether it's pro or against, do it from a biologic perspective, not a knee-jerk perspective. Let's go on. So FODMAPs is the understanding of the damage that sugar starch, fiber, and a fiber-based biome does to the human body. And this in particular concerns irritable bowel syndrome, but so many other diseases. Irritable bowel syndrome being constipation, diarrhea, alternating diarrhea, constipation, bloating, gastroesophageal, reflux disease, diverticulosis, diverticulitis, and possibly even colon cancer. And, and we can break this down. And um, essentially, what all of these things are, are sugars star and starches that the human body, through evolution, has lost the ability to process and absorb. So these are things that remain in the human intestine. And one of the reasons I don't like the whole concept of net carbohydrates is because net carbohydrates tries to, using a mathematical formula, eliminate carbohydrates that do not get absorbed, which is basically the FODMAP diet. What, if you extract absorbable carbohydrates from all foods, you're left with FODMAP. We use total carbohydrates because the total carbohydrates are as important whether they get absorbed or not in terms of disease processes. So I love the focus on FODMAP. Now, what it's talking about is water consumption and fermentation. And so what happens when we eat these things? Well, human beings as a species have lost the capacity to pro process the FODMAP foods, either in the stomach or the colon, for nutrient absorption. Vegetarian animals and certain uh, um, older primates like gorillas have retained the ability to ferment these foods together with certain bacteria, both in the stomach, cows have massive stomachs, um, or in what human beings have a vestigial organ called the cecum or the, or the appendix, which is a rabbit, for example, has a very huge appendix. And gorillas have these large colons where they can ferment, break down these FODMAP foods and actually extract both energy and uh, uh, nutrients from these foods, human beings have lost that capacity through evolution. In human beings, it is exclusively our small intestine that is the absorp absorptive surface, and we use enzymatic breakdown of most foods rather than fermentation as a way to create that absorption. But just of interest, you can make any mammal fat or diabetic by feeding them sugar. Those animals that still have the ability to break down the FODMAP foods, these mono and poly and disaccharides, use bacteria to break those sugars down into simple sugars, and then those same bacteria turn them into fatty acids, into fat. And it's the fat that gets absorbed in the intestine of these animals, not the sugar. So that's an important concept. No mammal is immune to harm from sugar. And that is an important concept for the carbohydrate skeptics. Be that as it may, in the human intestine, because we cannot absorb that food, well, we have to turn that cellulose and those monosaccharides and disaccharides into poop. How does that occur? Well, first of all, there's a huge influx of water. 
And we've used that as an argument to say that fiber is essential in the water, uh, in our food, because it turns that the water and the fiber makes the poop possible. Ask anyone with irritable bowel syndrome if that really works. No, it doesn't. So all these vegetable-based psyllium seeds and the metamucils and uh, all of the laxatives that are plant-based actually add and cause more harm than any good. Just remember that. But really what happens is underwater and the certain bacteria and funguses and viruses that come along with those vegetable materials in the human colon, we ferment that stuff. It doesn't get absorbed because the colon can only absorb salt and water, but it gets fermented and it turns into certain types of fat, but it really turns into poop. But together with the bile, the bile acids, the bile salts, um, which also cause fermentation of fats within the colon that cannot be absorbed, that fermentation, including fructose and lactose fermentation and the creation of sugar alcohols, that fermentation damages the human colon. May cause diarrhea, may cause cramping, may cause bloating with the release of gases, but certainly damages the cells of the colon, may trigger inflammation, autoimmune disease, which is a cross-reaction of our inflammatory system. Remember, about a third of the human uh, in, uh, uh, immune system is very active in the intestine, particularly the colon, may activate that immune system to cross-react and cause, or cause autoimmune disease, creates a leaky gut where you've got all this immune activation, but also may cause inflammation, bleeding, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, colitis, cancer, and also weakening of the wall of the intestine that eventually leads to diverticulosis, all based on something that most human beings consider essential in the diet, which is this thing called fiber, which is another substitute for the word FODMAP. Now, there are one place where I've been right and one place where I may have been wrong for certain people, and that is that as part of FODMAPs is, are the grain products. And we mostly focus on the glutens, but also those grain products are all fodder, yeah, fodder for fermentation in the stomach, in the small intestine, and mostly in the colon. So the grain products have very little value and extraordinary harm, not only through gluten and the gluten-like uh, activation of the immune system, but also in terms of that fermentation cycle. And I've been absolutely right in saying grains are awful for the human diet. There's really no value to grains other than subsistence maybe for certain uh, uh, peasant cultures. However, the place where I have been wrong, and I'm not going to change my opinion on this, it's your choice. If you suffer irritable bowel syndrome, if you suffer from the negative consequences of the FODMAP foods, then stay the hell away from artificial sweeteners. Because artificial sweeteners, have, they pose a liability because uh, certain of these sugar alcohols increase or enhance the FODMAP uh, um, irritable bowel syndrome stuff. However, if you do not suffer clinical effect from this, and especially if you're trying to recover from the dangers of sugar, then artificial sweeteners are a very useful substitute to come off the FODMAP, uh, sorry, off the regular sugars. If you have irritable bowel, if they cause bloating, of course, use logic to stay away from them. But they certainly can drive harm, but not in everybody. So I use artificial sweetness from time to time in my own life to prevent me from pigging out on the real sugar. So we use it as methadone for someone trying to quit heroin. But don't go to artificial sweetness, and if they cause you harm, if they make you feel like crap, logically stay away from them. But acid reflux, uh, 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 regurgitation, is highly, highly driven by the FODMAP foods. And what we find is a lot of people going keto, getting rid of the carbohydrates, and then also, and it's the total carbohydrates, which includes this stuff. But also, for folks going carnivore, their acid reflux, their heartburn, their uh, um, dyspepsia, improves remarkably. We also find that Bloating and irritable bowel syndrome gets so much better. And we find in Crohn's disease patients and ulcerative colitis, they can put both of those diseases in remission over time as the biome adapts. So there is a huge positive benefit to avoiding the FODMAP foods. 
And what I'm telling people is do the experiment. If you've got irritable bowel syndrome, if you've got uh, uh, colitis or inflammatory bowel syndrome, if you have acid reflux or GERD, try the anti-carbohydrate, anti-FODMAP diet. Get rid of that from those foods from your diet and see over the course of maybe four to six weeks if there's an improvement. Then the decision you make is saying, yeah, getting rid of these foods makes me feel so much better, but I love my sugars to get high on, so I'll tolerate the irritable bowel to have some of this crap from time to time. Or, you know what, I love being normal, and if the price I pay is not getting high on carbohydrates anymore, I'm okay paying that price. That's an individual decision. Don't tell people they have to, you must get... No. As long as you understand that the FODMAP foods have a high propensity to trigger irritable bowel syndrome, to trigger colitis, to trigger gastroesophageal reflux, to potentiate uh, diverticulitis and diverticulosis and colon cancer, then you can make an individual decision for yourself. I love this so much, stuff so much, I'm not going to give it up. Or you know what? The diseases are overbearing, I'm going to stay away from it. If you do that, folks, if you do do that, make sure that you substitute the valuable role of that fiber and get rid of it because of its harm, but you retain the value. Where does the value come from? It, the value of having healthy poop comes from three things. Number one, adding a lot of salt to your food. Three to five grams per day for the average adult. Salt is very important in the colon for sucking water into the colon. The colon can still excrete and absorb salt. And the second thing is water, hydration. Don't overdo the hydration, but make sure you drink a decent amount of fluid. Don't force yourself to drink water, but drink when you're thirsty. Because salt, water, and saturated fat, saturated fat are the three components of a healthy bowel movement in carnivore or in a non-FODMAP food diet. So if you're going to stay away from these powerful, toxic mono dye and polysaccharides and uh, polyols, if you're going to stay away from things that ferment in your body, including fructose and lactose, which means you're not going to do dairy, do the experiment. I love dairy. Dairy causes me no tangible harm and is of huge benefit in helping me to stay away from carbohydrates. But that may not be you. Don't demonize dairy, but stay away from it if it makes you upset. And if the fermentation of those foods in your body that may cause harm. So do the experiment. Do the experiment. Get rid of the FODMAP class of foods. No dairy, no grains, no fibrous vegetables, basically no vegetables. Stay mostly on the carnivore diet. Do it for four to six weeks and see if there's an improvement. If the way of life is easy and it's enjoyable and you're getting a decent range of nutrients, stick with it. If the lifestyle sucks, then start adding things back until you discover, well, this doesn't do so well, but I'm fine with this. That was my approach. I found that dairy caused me no harm. Coffee certainly causes me no harm. Some of the vegetables, mm, not so great. Do the experiment, but understand that there is a significant amount of harm in a large number of people that does come from the FODMAP diets. Before you start taking medications for your irritable bowel syndrome, before you're on a whole bunch of toxic immunosuppressants for your Crohn's disease, try this. But remember, if you do it today, don't expect a result tomorrow. It takes months, three to six months, before you begin to see results because the whole biome has to change. And that takes time. may even take some antibiotics in severe Crohn's disease patients. But yes, those diseases you can put into remission. Try it sometime. This is a very, very positive message. And I love the concept. See if it works for you. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And if you like this video, subscribe to this channel. Hit the subscribe button. But also support us by throwing a cup of coffee at us on our Patreon account. Not literally. In terms of a few dollars. Carb Addiction Doc is our Patreon account. Thanks so much.